So this is Bob Ferguson, and this is another episode of Life with Bob, wherein on most Mondays, I sit with someone, uh, more often than not, someone who's very prominent, someone who's done some really extraordinary things in their life, and we talk about the state of the world. We talk about issues that make a difference, issues that we really, I feel, we really need to pay attention to. So this is my little soapbox, and tonight it is my extraordinary pleasure to be hosting Rear Admiral Len Herring as my guest. And uh, I uh, joked with Len that I, I looked over his uh, CV and I said, there's no possible way to make a, <laughs> a short introduction of that. So what I'm going to do is uh, read this to you, but before I do this, Len, thank you very much for being on with us tonight. It's really an honor. Truly thrilled. I'm glad to be here, Bob. That's great. And Len and I worked in a, in a company together. He provided some expertise, uh, expert actual, actually uh, presentation for us, and have been able to keep track of him over the years. And uh, I think to very much to my, my great benefit and pleasure. So I'm going to go ahead and read the introduction, and then we're going to get rolling. So Rear Admiral Len Herring, U.S. Navy retired as a prominent military and civilian sustainability leader with a broad background in energy and environmental issues. His passion in sustainability lies in educating people on the dangers the future holds without taking responsible actions to secure, us, to secure the nation's energy independence and to preserve water, air, quality, and other resources. While in the Navy, Herring's efforts included everything from, from renewable energy to responsible water use and conservation. He built a team recognized throughout the Department of Defense as the best in environmental protection and sustainability innovation. Herring instigated wind, thermal, photovoltaic, conversion technology, and alternative fuel use at all levels in Navy facilities. President Bush awarded Herring a 2005 Presidential Award for Leadership in Federal Energy Management. From 2009 to 2012, Herring joined the University of San Diego, where as Vice President for Business Services and Administration, he initiated numerous sustainability measures on campus, including the installation of the largest PV system, that is the photovoltaic system, of any private nonprofit university in the nation. From 2012 to 2018, Herring served as the Executive Director for the Center for Sustainable Energy. The Center for Sustainable Energy, CSE, provides people with information, incentives, and opportunities to help make these choices easier. Their mission is to work with policymakers, public agencies, local governments, utilities, business and civic leaders, and individuals to transform the nation's energy marketplace and beyond. Today, Len serves as Executive Director of I Love a Clean San Diego County, a nonprofit focused on making America's finest region, America's cleanest, most environmental, uh, and with the most cleanest and most environmental conscience. He also proudly serves as an, on a number of nonprofit boards and is an active military advisor to the Center for Climate and National Security and the American College of National Security Leaders. Len holds a BS in meteorology and oceanography from SUNY New York, uh, Maritime College, an MS in international relationships, relations and strategic studies from the Naval War College, and an MBA from South Regina University. Wow, Len, you've done a few things in your life. <laughs> Just starting. Just starting, that, that's, that's, that's my view. I mean, every time I get up in the morning, it says, wow, it's been a pretty good start so far. Let's, you know, what, what's, what's doing today? What's doing tomorrow? Well, that's, a, you know, that, it's so different, Bob, because I, you know, for the better part of my career, it, it always seemed like I was focused on something a little bit greater. And now my, now my efforts are, while I continue to support and raise and defend, um, my efforts are really focused on something totally different and something that, um, you know, I, I, I tell people often that it's not, it's not about me anymore. Um, because the consequences that we're going to talk about tonight are not going to impact me, but are going to impact, more importantly, um, my grandchildren, um, of which I have five. Um, and the, the aspects and situations that we are going to discuss tonight really are more 
relative to what they will experience um, than what I will experience the remainder of my life. And I think that's one of the reasons why it becomes so difficult to talk to um, decision makers and people today within the environment because they don't understand the consequences and how rapidly things are changing um, and what, where and in time um, is it that we need to focus so that we that our energies and efforts today, the decisions we make today are really about my grandchildren. They're not about me. Um, they're not even about my children. Um, they are about their children and what they will have to deal with over the course of the next 40 to 50 years. Well, you know, I, I was there with my, uh, I have, you got your one up on me. I got four grandkids and I was there in Godfrey, Illinois this morning and uh, doing the snuggy buggies with my little granddaughter and thinking about this little child, five years old, she's got a long run ahead of us, ahead of her. And we've had a good run. You know, we've used a lot of resources. We sucked up a lot of resources. We broadly, you know, in our, in, in the advanced uh, societies. And uh, we owe it to people in other parts of the world and we owe it to our grandchildren to really think about these things. And they're, they're, hard, they're hard things to think about, aren't they? Yeah, they're difficult to wrestle with and many, many people, you know, they truly do believe somehow in this warped system that we have, that the resources that are provided to us as a whole um, have re redundancy and abundancy beyond um, all expectations. And when you, when you start to recognize that, um, especially for those of us in America, unfortunately, America is a unique place. Um, and you know, my experience in the military has provided me some great opportunities. Um, I've been to 63 different countries, 154 different ports. I've sailed virtually every ocean. I've stood on every continent except the, the, the Antarctic, um, of which is on my bucket list. I, I so want to do that. Um, I've circumnavigated the globe at the North Pole in four and a half seconds um, at 91 below zero. So, you know, it, there are so many things that Americans think they know about the rest of the world, but have no clue um, what really is out there. Um, and why it's so important that we stop looking at things through the, our, our lenses, our glasses, um, and start focusing on how the rest of the world is evolving, and more importantly, the impacts of how the rest of the world will have a drain um, on the resources that we consider necessary for what we consider to be progressive life in, in America and, and in the rest of the world. 72% um, of the world's population's annual income is just $42 American. Yeah. Um, and again, 72%, just $42. And there are even some studies that show that it may be significantly less than that, but I kind of use the one that's a little more conservative. Um, but if you think about that, just imagine most people, there are people in this country um, who make that in a, a half a day. Um, and that's what we consider to be poverty level. Um, yeah. So we really do need to figure out and, uh, and understand how the rest of the world is evolving and why the consequences of that evolution um, in the time that we are currently in will have an even greater impact on how our grandchildren are able to survive. Well, and again, I appreciate you coming on because I think uh, <clears throat> it's easy for some people to say, well, hey, as you said, somehow the resources will be there. They've always been there. We'll, we'll figure it out. Or the people who are involved and in thinking about this are just simply not realistic or they don't, uh, they don't take a responsible view to the world. So someone who's done what you've done and uh, in the military and beyond, I think it's important for people to hear from folks like you. So I understand you have a slide deck for us and yep. why don't you bring it up and let's uh, get going and get into the meat of this. So let's, let, let's go ahead and share. Tell me when you can see it. Okay. Got it? Okay, got it. Okay, so let's, let's start right at the beginning because I think that the smart thing to do is um, to really begin to understand what are, what are we dealing with and why are each aspects of um, this um, greater picture um, important for us. So I like to start here. And again, I'm a meteorologist and oceanographer by degree, a climatologist by study. So um, there's a little bit of difference and we'll talk about the difference between climate and, and weather um, later. But the most important part 
um, is certainly um, our ocean's health. Um, there's, there is one thing that makes us different from virtually every other planet um, on the face on, in the universe, and that's water. Um, water and the carbon cycle. And the carbon cycle, you know, as you've heard many times, um, it is the consequence that separates Earth from space. Um, and yes, it's all part of the relevant, but the truth is, is that the one piece that's even more critical um, is our ocean's health. And today we find our oceans in a very desperate and just, just desperate condition um, from a health perspective. Um, the, our oceans sequester 80 times more carbon, um, and it is a process of which um, is very, very important, again, to the balance of our nature and our environment. Um, it helps to stabilize our temperature. It helps to maximize and create an environment that is um, conducive to uh, the, the, the normal exchange of carbon and, and greenhouse gases within the, the world. But today, we literally have taken such bad care of our oceans um, that there are things that are happening that, I mean, people just don't want to talk about. It. And they are consequences of magnitude beyond um, what people have thought about. Um, one of, probably one of the biggest things is that um, over the course of the last two decades, we've fished out 90% of the adult populations of the world's fish. Um, and this is a, of significance, why? Well, because roughly 70% of the population, especially in the Pacific, receives its protein primarily from the ocean. Um, and the ocean, again, is very, very sick. They're not, they're, it's outfished. Um, and you can see by this graph, this slide, um, that the population in, in extrapolated long term, somewhere around 2030, 2040, um, we're in a point in which you're not going to be able to find fish anywhere. Um, and then we, have, of course, we have the other piece of this, and that is uh, uh, our oceans have become our wastebaskets. Um, in six years from now, scientists, scientists forecast that the tonnage of trash within our oceans will exceed the tonnage of fish. Um, and that's how bad things have gotten. And we're, we, we have seven major gyres across the globe. Each of the oceans form their own. But some of these gyres, uh, the North Pacific gyre, for example, is twice the size of the state of Texas. Um, it is a significant trash bin, basically. And the depth of that is roughly 900 feet or more. Um, people think it's all on the surface, it's not. The microplastics that form in this stuff break down into a, in a, into a fashion in which um, becomes part of the food chain. And of course, we're at the top of the food chain. Um, all of those plastics, the biofilter, bioplastics and things um, are actually known carcinogens, uh, which means we are allowing these elements to become part of our nature and environment. Um, they're decimating large portions of, um, of wildlife. Um, this is a picture of an albatross um, in which it literally has picked up all of these little bits and pieces from the ocean thinking it's dead fish. Um, but scientists have forecast that within the next six to eight years, um, the Pacific albatross may become extinct, not because of some other fashion, but because we literally have caused it to starve to death. Um, and the, the, the sad part about this is that um, an animal cannot regurgitate in the same fashion as human beings because carnivores have developed a different structure. Um, but this bird continues to feed until it's full, and then it believes it's actually full, therefore it stops feeding. So the bird doesn't die of the plastics. The bird actually suffers a very, very painful death um, as it starves to death um, because it can't, it won't, it just stops eating. So the impacts are huge and the World Wildlife Federation now, now has declared last year that 92.4% of all necropsies done by the World Wildlife Federation have found some form of plastic or plastic materials either within the animal itself or in its cell structure. So these par particulate matters that we are allowing to be released into the environment have now become part of a very serious um, environmental contamination problem within the animal kingdom. Um, and of course, we at the top of that, 
And, and there's some very serious consequences that are out there and people don't even recognize, you know, you can have a conversation and people don't even recognize, but this is a picture and I, I showed this to you earlier, but this is a picture of an island off the coast of Midway um, after a storm. But this is part of that garbage patch that just washes um, onto the beaches. This is our waste. Um, we want to blame it on everyone else, but the truth of the matter is for the last two decades, we have been packaging up our materials and we've been sending it over the, over the horizon um, to places like China and Indonesia and Malaysia and other places for them to process those materials. They took what could be processed, but everything else that couldn't be processed, they just piled up on these islands and places. And now we've gotten to the point where literally tens of millions of pounds of material are being washed away um, and out into our oceans. And this material is ours from all over the globe. It's not, it's not China, it's not coming from Indonesia. Um, it, it literally is ours, it's just wasted. Um, so then we have to take a look at, you know, mankind and nature and I say, okay, so what, what does this really have to do with it? Well, it's changing fast and we are having a, a, a dire consequence. You've heard for the half your life, um, you know, man is destroying the rainforest, man is destroying this forest. Um, we're taking out all of the efforts um, Terra is a significant sequestration capacity of the earth, um, but so too is uh, all the other things that are going on. As I said, the ocean is 80 times more um, potent in its sequestration. Um, ice and formation of ice um, is 40 times more um, important because it sequesters and holds long term, um, which is one of the problems that we're having today, and we'll discuss that in a little bit. But the way things are happening on a total because of both drought um, and fire, um, we're having serious consequences because the forests throughout our entire globe are being um, seriously impacted. Um, last year alone, fire destroyed more forest um, and sequestration habitat um, on the terra portion of our earth um, in one single year than did 10 years of man's destruction in the forests. So we're seeing a much greater extent of the fires um, and other things throughout the globe. And even though we're, you know, we're struggling in California, we, we just talked that we have two major, two major fires again, which are destroying large portions. Um, but in Siberia, they had 2,500 fires of equal size um, last year. Um, if you take a look at the Yukon and other places, you'll see that there are massive fires, tens of thousands, but they're in the middle of nowhere. Um, and they literally are just left to burn until they're done. Um, you saw the rainforest um, in, you know, in South, South America this year go through that entire process. Um, and yeah, those were man-made and they were set, but there's still forest and there's still fires that are destroying that sequestration. So what is it doing? Well, it's having a major effect on virtually everything. Um, and you know, I'm just going to celebrate my 65th birthday, but the sad part of this is that more animals have gone extinct in my lifetime than the previous 1800 years. And that's not a proud thing that we should be championing. I mean, you know, he, he gave us this for dominance, but not dominance for the destruction, dominance for its protection. Um, and we're not doing a very good job of this. Many of the um, significant aspects of our marine, or of our mammal uh, population are at the brink of extinction. Um, they say that within the next 70 to 80 years, um, there may be no large mammals um, on the face of the earth if we don't do something now um, to stop it. Um, Wildlife Federation yesterday released a, a number where there's only 7,100 cheetahs left on the face of the earth. And it used to be a dominant cat in the predatory um, system, but now because of man's encroachment and the changing um, through hunting and other fashions, it's almost gone extinct. And it used to roam three continents and now it's, only, it's predominantly on one. So. You know, we've got to we've got to figure out how to create this balance. And there's so many so many places like Yellowstone, for example. You know, Yellowstone has shown the importance of balance, the reintroduction of the wolf, um, and how that timber wolf um, recreated an environment that was virtually on the on the just literally on the edge of being a catastrophic um, change. The populations had gone awry. Um, the, the, the meandering of the creeks and things were destroying large portions of um, Yellowstone. They reintroduced the timber wolf 
um, and all of a sudden birds and habitats started to recover. Um, the meandering of the rivers and streams ceased because they weren't overfeeding and the vegetation was coming back. And the, the entire northern part of Yellowstone has been restored um, by the consequence of, again, reestablishing the principle uh, by which, you know, our habitat. And, and we really do need to understand that it's so very, very important um, that every aspect of this is taken in consequence with, with, with each other. Um, you know, we, we live in a, a region in which um, very large portions of the, of the citrus, for example, citrus and other vegetables grown here in California. Um, and the bird and the bee population is the only real pollinator of that particular vegetation. Um, and we are in crisis that the bee population, the indigenous bee population of California is at risk. Um, so we ship in bees from other locations. We increase and continue to increase the viruses. And we're doing more harm than good um, in making sure that that population remains consistent. So it is a big deal, but we, we do have to figure out how to, how to get this back in balance. And it, it isn't all about, um, you know, just saving the owl. It's, it, it's a lot more than that. The next piece that we have to concentrate on and be aware of is that um, the world is going through its fifth round of doubling. And what I mean by that is um, if you take a, a jar and you put two marbles in it and then you put four marbles in it, you took eight marbles in it, 16, 32, blah, 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 blah. That's, that's the earth as we know it. Well, when earth when began, and I won't get into the religious aspect of creation, whatever, but when man came around and we started counting them, um, there were two, and by 1850, we had gotten to 1.5 billion. Um, and you can see that that's a period um, that is very important, um, primarily because 1850 marks the start of the second industrial revolution, the introduction of the combustion engine, um, fossil fuels, and the like. So me mechanized and industrial um, um, creation. From that point, we went from 1850 um, to today, and today we are roughly 7.4 to 7.6 people, 7.6 billion. Um, so you can see from 1850 to today, we have nearly tripled um, that population um, in just a little bit over 100 years. But in the next 40 years, um, we will be expanding our population from 7.4 to 9.6, between 9.6 and potentially 10 billion. Um, so by 1850, we will have roughly 9.6 to 10 billion persons on the face of the earth. And that is um, the equivalent of adding a brand new India and China to the face of the earth. So in just 40 years, imagine putting a new India and a new China um, into the complicated metrics that we have as what is mankind today. Um, and that, that, that's a really significant issue. Um, and I will also point out that, uh, you know, the previous chart shows that um, we in the industrialized world are maintaining our population fairly well. Um, the world's population growth is occurring in the third world. Um, that portion of the world, which is least, least able to accommodate um, that aspect of growth um, and probably more affected by the subjects that we're going to talk about um, when it comes to climate change. The next thing we have to look at is food security and the ability for us to be able to do that. Um, of course, the consequences, as everyone knows, food is a substance that we have to do without, with or without um, one way or another. They're going to find out how to get there from here. Um, and uh, in America, you know, we're, we're a pretty wasteful society. Um, we actually throw out about 40% of everything that we grow. Um, and that is in itself um, a real characteristic that I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to say we have commercials um, in which we um, declare um, a, a, an issue of um, depravity um, in some portions of our population, but yet um, we throw out 40% of everything we grow. Um, I would contend that we don't have a food problem, um, a nutrition problem in the United States. We have a distribution um, and capitalistic venture problem um, that makes this, uh, this difference um, actually relevant in the most prosperous country in the world. Um, but the truth is, is that in other places, 
Um, there are hundreds of thousands who go days, if not weeks, um, between what is a, a considered to be um, an, an ample food supply. Um, you know, we have manufacturers in the United States who have destroyed, and I won't mention the particular um, company, but they're the only ones who did provide the information um, for this study. Um, but they destroyed 80,000 tons of processed grains and cereals because the product failed to sell by sell-by date. And for those of you who understand the commercial aspect of sell by sell by date, there's only really two products that that affect that is really affected. And that is dairy and prepared foods and pharmaceuticals. Virtually everything else is there for the protection of the, the producer. Um, and they all, all they really do is tell you that they don't guarantee the quality um, of that product if it's been compromised or damaged beyond that point. So it's really it has nothing to do. And oh, by the way, um, most of the materials that this particular company destroyed was, again, grains um, and processed wheats and cereals. Um, and we have recovered barrels of oatmeal um, from the 15th century that still, even without the additives or preservatives um, that we apply to our food today, um, are still in absolutely superb condition and ready for eating. So it, it is a distribution issue, and it's, a, it's a, an issue that we need to become more educated on to make sure that it doesn't happen. But the global hunger on the rise is on the rise. Um, here we are in a point where um, this is a, a chart from the um, from the um, from the UN, um, and of course this was 2013, and you can see the rise. Um, one point, roughly one billion people, um, a sixth of the population at that point um, was uh, considered to be undernourished. Um, and those individuals um, did not have the same life expectancy based upon um, the premature nutrition that's necessary to develop and create a strong and healthy human being going forward. So um, at the same point in time, um, which is one of the reasons why there's a huge population increase, is because longevity um, of the, the population is being sacrificed because the nutrition characteristics are also um, a, you know, creating a difference in mortality. Um, and when we look at it um, in total, if we would not understanding of the consequences of what's there, um, again, in order to satisfy the growth that I just mentioned with the food population that we need to create, we're going to have to produce more food um, to maintain a nutritionally balanced population, um, more food in the next 40 years than we have in the past 10,000. Um, that statistic combined with some of the other things that we're going to talk about, um, again, are, are one of the reasons why it's so hard for people to focus on things because everybody tries to look at this in a stovepipe-like fashion, but all of these things are happening in sequence with one another. They all have an inter intermeshing um, consequence with one another because, um, you know, the next one is probably the biggest one. Um, you know, we can go 30 days without food. Um, and you can, in fact, go 30 days without food, but you can't go 72 hours without water. Um, the human body requires, and virtually every living thing on the face of the earth requires water every day to live. 14 ounces of water are ne a necessity for the normal human being for, to maintain cellular structure and health. So if we don't have that, what do we do? Well, the truth of the matter is water is becoming more and more scarce. Um, the more the climate changes, the more scarce it will become. Um, the aspects of, um, of glacial melting and other things uh, will have serious consequences on some of the more drastic areas of the world. Um, in particular, the Himalayas um, and the, 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 uh, the mountains um, within Africa. Um, of course, those glaciers are providing a, a, a stable aspect of water, but when those glaciers disappear, um, the probability of their maintaining the water supply for what is roughly a, th a third of the world's population um, will cease to exist. And it's not that the glacier will disappear. It's the dynamic of the environment is such that the water will no longer reach the reservoirs that have been created over centuries. So those waters, while, they will, while those glaciers will continue to dissipate over maybe the next two centuries, the amount of water that flows will be insufficient to provide the sourcing at the bottom of the mountains um, that that population requires. 
So there's, again, there's a lot of talk about, well, they've hit, you know, the glaciers have already receded and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, the, the difference is here is that, again, everything that we've talked about prior was not part of the, of the conversation before. Um, there was not um, 10 billion people on the face of the earth all needing that water supply. Um, there was not the opportunity where the climate and the change was um, there in the same fashion. We were not seeing large portions of the world um, in which such huge numbers of individuals have conjugated in a fashion where, you know, here it's clear, 85% of the world's population lives in the driest half of the planet. Wow. Um, you know, we settled there because the, the abilities um, and the rest of the resources in that portion of the planet were there. But, um, you know, we have 783 million people who don't have access to clean water. Um, and that's just in, you know, 600 million in India and they don't know how many in other places and other regions. Um, but, you know, the consequences are significant when you look at um, where all of this is happening and how destabilizing each of these elements are um, to the larger scale. And we can't, <clears throat> we can't just assume that um, a technology will be, a, be promoted tomorrow, which is going to solve the problem. It's, it takes longer than that um, to commercialize in many cases. Um, it takes much longer than that um, to be able to, um, to even, in some, in, in some cases, change the environment so that the adaptability of the environment is such that um, it accommodates um, the changes in the technologies that are being introduced. So the next part that we, you know, we, that I like to focus on is climate and not weather. Um, the climate is changing. Scientists, climatologists agree that the climate is changing um, 10 times faster than it has in the past 65 million years. Now, there's no argument amongst most of the scientists who have studied the climate. I was a denier in the 90s, and I am no longer a denier after spending a, a decade, a little over a decade and a half researching and studying talking to those individuals who have had the opportunity to research and study. Um, but the truth is, is that um, it is happening. What isn't um, uh, fully agreed with by almost all of those scientists is the actual consequence by which it is occurring. So many will tell you that it's introduced by X, then somebody will say, well, it's not X, it's X minus Y. Okay, got it. But the fact is, is that they all agree the climate is changing faster than it has in the past 65 million years. And what we are experiencing now are extremes. And those extremes are, from a climatological perspective, much more relevant to what's happening because the consequences of extreme weather are those which are the most devastating to the population of the Earth. Um, we can have an increase in storms and, and, and those sort of a deal, but when you have a category four storm and when you have a season like we had last year with five category five storms, um, when I was in college, Dr. Dooley, uh, Dr. Dooley, who was my professor, would always tell me that there's not enough energy in the ocean to produce more than three of these storms in a, at a single point. Um, and, um, you know, when I called him, <laughs> later on last year, and I said, hey, uh, there are five category storms, and he says, yes, Len, but the climate and the environment is completely different. Um, the temperatures that we talked about when we were in the 70s are not the same temperatures that we're talking about within the climate and the environment today. Ocean temperatures are significantly warmer. Air temperatures are significantly warmer, and they change the dynamic by which those severe climate conditions occur. So you can see that we're having more flooding, um, significantly greater windstorms. Again, in California today, we're having another round of Santa Ana's where we have um, sustained winds of in excess of 100 miles an hour. It's, that's hurricane force. Um, and they're coming off the desert uh, with a high pressure center and they're doing some devastating things to uh, the environment. Um, and then the, the other piece of that is the drought resistance that it's creating. Many of those, uh, you know, I would tell you that um, you know, I don't have to be so uh, conscious anymore, but I would tell you that most of the troubles in the Middle East um, are really a 17-year drought. They are the culmination of 17 years of extreme dry weather um, in an area of the world which is, was predominantly um, um, farmers. Um, that particular portion of the world has been the breadbasket of the Middle East since the since you know times of Jesus, um, and and all of that through that period of time. Um, but for the past 17 years, it's been absolutely arid. 
Um, it is now the hottest place on the face of the earth. Um, it rivals um, some of the major portions of the desert and now is even taken over for what Australia suffered um, for almost 19 years. So what causes it, and you have to take a look at, well, the, one of the biggest reasons, of course, is the greenhouse gases. Um, and greenhouse gases and the changes um, in that environment are actually causing some significant shifts um, in the way the atmosphere responds um, to those changes as they occur. Um, and this is a chart in which, for the longest time, I just, this was one I couldn't comprehend because I couldn't figure out how they could get here from here. But carbon dating and the opportunity to be able to analyze um, has really helped to make sure that this um, graph is correct. Um, and, and, you know, you'll see charts like this um, in other places, but the truth is, is that anything past 650,000 years ago um, is irrelevant to man and, and the mammal on the face of the earth. Um, it may have been significantly higher, um, you know, 12 to 15 million years ago, but we weren't around then, so who cares? Um, the truth is, is that from the time that man has been on the face of the earth, the carbon has never been above um, 300 parts per million. Um, and today it's significantly higher than 400. Um, as a matter of fact, we are at 415. Um, and that is consequently, uh, you know, from an exponential rise um, from the 1850s. You can see on the far right side of the, that graph um, that it goes almost straight up, um, different from all the rest of them. And the time period um, in which that really occurs is almost 1870 to today. So it's going straight up. Um, from a time perspective, different from all the rest. And of course, that has consequences across the globe because the temperatures are changing. Sea level rise and its effects um, are a major condition that we have to deal with. Um, and when you take a look at this chart, um, 44 centimeters is roughly 13 inches, but you can see that the chart shows that there are major portions throughout the globe that will have uh, massive impacts um, of the, the, the way that they will have to deal with the sea level rise. And it all depends on which one you want to look at. Um, how do you get there from here? And, um, you know, scientists have their different um, objectives. Each of them come to the table with a little different forecast. Um, the, the IPCC um, best case scenario is, a, is what's called 2.6. Um, worst case scenario is the 8.5. Um, and of course, what they call plus plus, um, which is the virtually the decimation of all um, glacial ice on the face of the earth today um, is the, the most drastic. Um, and of course, sea level rise can be anywhere from um, 13 to six feet. Um, and you know the consequences of that are really not so much in the fact that the sea can rise that high. The consequences go back to the climate and weather um, where storm surge associated with these massive storms will have much greater impact um, around the coastlines of each of the continents as they have to deal with these. So if you recognize that the, the height of um, the um, highest point in Miami is just 12 feet above sea level, a category five storm with a 25 to 30 foot tidal surge will completely wipe out Miami. Um, which is why it's so interesting when people think that it's not a big deal um, if you if you remember the the footage of the guy standing under the bridge that used to be the passageway into the Fort Lauderdale inner uh, intercoastal, um, you know I'm thinking to myself, do you not understand what's happening here? Um, the force that's required to pull out literally hundreds of millions of gallons of water from the intercoastal and drag it out to sea, and if that hurricane should happen to shear tomorrow or shear in an hour or so where all that water is going to go. Um, and they don't, they don't see that as, as one of these consequences. So now we get to the other part. And you know, of course, um, if you want to stop here for some questions, I can do that. And if not, I can get to the next one. So I'm going to stop sharing and we can talk for a minute. Wow, Len, boy, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's daunting, isn't it? What yeah, it is. actually is happening. And when we were first talking, this, this is where the talk finished. And I said, well, we don't want people jumping off bridges. Uh, we need to uh, we need to talk about okay. <clears throat> there's all of these seemingly insurmountable problems, but then again, when you looked at Northern Yellowstone, and you looked at the at the river, you know, 
breaching its banks and the deer population going crazy and the entire ecosystem collapsing and you introduce timber wolves again and uh, there, there's a beautiful little little video. I'll see if I can find it and post it up. It's called uh, How Wolves Saved a River. Exactly. And you put the top predator back, in this particular instance, just a, a metaphor for restoring the balance of nature as we, as, as it's evolved over the last several billion years. Um, you get the result that you couldn't possibly get with our small human awareness. So I guess, you know, maybe, you know, as a military guy and as someone who is deeply steeped in all aspects of sustainability, before we jump into the other slides, I think a lot of people are going to be asking themselves, well, what the heck can I do? You know, if there's going to be three, three or four billion more people, if all of these dynamics are all set anyway, what's our responsibility as individual children of God, if you will, as, as individuals in the world? What is our responsibility from your, from your perspective? Yeah, and I, I'm actually glad that you said that because it's, I, I'm so very cautious when I go out and speak um, about individual children of God um, and the, okay. the aspect of the aspect of our ability to be able to translate the gift that he has provided us to our daily life and what that truly does mean for us. I think that what we've ended up doing is becoming so much more involved with the, the possession of what it is that we have instead of the sharing of what it is that we have. The average American um, and today, you know, I, I'm, I, I work at, I love a clean San Diego, and it's really about the three R's, the recycling, the reuse, um, and, the, and the, the, um, the restructure. So when you, when you look at it, you say, the average American has 33,000 possessions. 33,000 possessions. If you were to touch one for every hour, every hour over the course, 16 years from now, you would reach the start of the first one that you were there. The fastest growing real estate entity in the United States <clears throat> is storage. So when you start thinking about what does it mean to, to do what it is that we have to do, you really have to go back and say, okay, so how do we live in an environment where um, potentially the consequences of our um, our hoarding of resource becomes a, a, a tipping point for other portions of the human race um, to, you know, to, to cause harm, hate, and discontent. Um, and I, I think that there's a lot for us to try to figure out how to get there from here. And it's not, <clears throat> it's not necessarily just changing, um, you know, going solar or while that is so very, very important, you know, maximizing, but looking at the opportunities to be able to minimize, but still pr protect what it is that we have. Um, you know, like I said, the food source, um, I, I find it very difficult in the prosperous country that we live in, um, that, you know, we have 70,000 homeless in, in LA, we have 30,000 homeless here in San Diego. And, and we have the ability um, as God's children to do things differently so that that opportunity and, and the, the worst part about it is we as Americans have the capability and, and the capacity where the rest of the world is not experiencing that same opportunity because they don't. Um, they truly don't. So how do we get there from here? I think that one, um, we have to be more uh, respectful of our task in showing the rest of the world how it is that we're going to adapt and live. And I think that our, uh, we need, we too, we too, and I'm saying this from a perspective of, um, you and I are both in the same generation. Right. Um, we need to tell our children that we blew it. We need to admit to them that our prosperity and greed will, if not changed, result in the desperation of your children and their children.
And we have, yes, we have created an environment of opportunity, but we have done so at the sake of others for the purpose of greed, but not as he would have expected it. And I, and I say this for, you know, we, we promote reuse as an example. Um, repurpose, re, reuse, repurpose. Um, it's not that I'm condemning the, the need to have to do so, but um, we work with a lot of faith-based organizations that identify need um, and source. Um, we don't expect our donors to expect some kind of cash flow or anything else for it. Um, if you, I mean, what is a consignment store for? For the return of something that you don't want anymore? <clears throat> is it not better? Is it not better thought of as a gift to those less privileged as an opportunity for us to be more understanding uh, of what it takes to get there from here? We all, we all know that, you know, here in San Diego, for example, it's extremely difficult for people to, to make it. Um, and, you know, they're, they're living in two bedroom apartments um, with three and four folks because they can't afford it. They can't afford furniture. They can't do the likes. Um, but yet every day we find a couch somewhere um, in, in our environment thrown away by somebody. Um, and again, the truth is, is that 85% of the items that are put in storage are never again touched. 85%. Well, you know, it, it's, it's so interesting. And I want, I want to, uh, you know, move on to the slides, but this is actually the, this conversation, I think, is as important <clears throat> as laying out, you know, what the problem is, even laying out some of the solutions from a technical standpoint. Because I think you struck something, uh, just a little bit of my background, some of the people who follow my Facebook feed. And, you know, some of the folks who are perhaps more conservative uh, in some ways than I am might be a little surprised. But um, you know, my mom was a theologian. She uh, has a master's in religious counseling and family systems from Chicago Theological Seminary, University of Chicago. We grew up with the ethic of caring for others, of taking care of others, and not wasting. It was not, it, it wasn't a virtue to spend something Sorry, or have could something. You could you oh, say? Oh, Siri, Siri, Siri thought I was talking to her. Um, you spend something or, 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 or use something or acquire something when you really don't need it. And I, I think I may have sent you a, I, taught uh, one of the Life with Bob segments with uh, Professor John Eichert, one of the great, great. really iconic uh, agricultural economists. And what he points out is very, very profound truths that you're, that you're touching on that I think go to the heart of the solution. Solutions are not just technical solutions. They're human solutions. Uh, and what John says is that not everything, not everything of value can be denominated in dollars. In fact, the most valuable things cannot be, in cannot be denominated in dollars. The hug of a little girl who comes sailing into your lap and snuggles under the, under the covers and gives you a big hug. What's the, what's the dollar value of that? What's the dollar value of love and appreciation of, of, of each other in a community is something that you, uh, you support you know, with your organization and we tried our best to do in Fairfield. What's the value of the Lord's Covered Garden at the Seed Center where we Great. grew hundreds and hundreds of pounds, Barb uh, Stone grew hundreds of pounds of uh, fresh, beautiful, nutrient dense produce that we put into the Lord's Covered, you know, our, our food bank. So, it's a failure. I mean, if you really want to get deep about it, you know, you can look at Plato's four levels of happiness, you know, sense pleasure and the pleasure of differentiation and then, then more the pleasure of, of helping people and then spiritual, you know, spiritual value. Most of our society is stuck in level one or level two, right? We're eating too much linguine and we're competing too much. We're thinking that by having more and more my mother, Roger Babson, you went to Babson College, right? Well, I grew up in Wellesley. 
So you know where, you know, right, right where I was on Forest Street, you know, right before you hit Washington Streets, you know, right where I, right where I, I grew up, Laurel Avenue, actually off of that. And uh, you know, Roger Babson was quite a character, but he did um, pay kids a dollar of a Bible verse back when I was young, but a dollar was a real dollar. So my mother said, okay, well, we can compete, but you're going to, you're going to memorize the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount. There you go and Lord's Prayer and all that. When I, when I think of the Lord's Prayer, it says, you know, give us this day our daily bread, right? It doesn't say give us this day our daily bread and bread for 10,000 years so we won't be paranoid, we'll ever run out of bread. It says, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us or debtors. Debtor. So, you know, we're, you never, we never can tell where, where these conversations are going to go, but it, it's refreshing to be able to talk with someone of your background about these very fundamental issues that give rise to all of this kind of chaos, right? Yeah. And, it, and it's amazing because we, we do have a, a number of, of, of interesting conversations. Um, my pastor and I have had a, a conversation in which I actually started to write what I thought was going to be an article. I, I still may end up um, pulling the rest of it together, but I, I kind of believe that um, potentially and been brought up that um, some, in some cases, um, the Bible holds re revelations of story, not necessarily truths, um, and is the forecast of um, Noah um, really a forecast of today, or was it something that happened in the past? Um, was, is there a probability that that proverb um, and that parable um, could be playing itself out um, again in history, if you believe the first one? But is this an opportunity where man causes his own extinction because he does not trust um, that what has been given to him, in fact, um, is being protected? And we are not, we are not being conscious um, in that same fashion. So... Um, you know, and I, and I, although he said Len had nothing to do with all of that, and I said, well, but it, you know, if you look at the consequences, um, the truth is, is that even those who partially believed perished um, because their absolution of um, divine opportunity was not real. Um, and I think that we're, when we're, we're looking at, if we're not more cautious and careful um, that if we don't have a more serious, no joke, heart driven conversation um, about where we have to go and the things we need to do in order to change um, and to teach those to our youth, regardless of whether you're religious or not, um, the, the, the truth is, is that um, the forecast for the future does not provide a model that looks like yesterday. Um, and if we are not, if we are not smart enough to convince the youth, that the errors of our generations and our grandparents' generations were one of waste and neglect, Yes. then they are destined to the same outcome as is forecast in the book. Um, because the consequences that are happening are happening faster than man can adapt and modify. Um, you know, we are in our first phase of regener regenerating um, and you know, changing. Um, but the truth is, is that you need hundreds of thousands of years um, for that to happen. Um, and we don't have that kind of time. It's not, um, it's not inconsequential to understand that, um, you know, as man is today, if the greenhouse gas and particulate matter reaches 440. Um, our cognitive ability to conduct this, what we're doing right now, is seriously impacted because that's the state in which an anesthesiologist brings your body to before he knocks you out completely. Well, you know, it, it, this is so fascinating. So then here, here we are, we're at 854 which means that if we dive into the next, um, next set of slides, we're gonna be here for a couple of hours. So here's, here's what I propose, that um, 
we in the next couple of weeks, uh, maybe even next week, I'll have to check the schedule, see if we can move it around. Let's do if if you if you've got time next Monday, let's do part two. Sure, I'll uh, take a look. I'll uh, take a look. I think next Monday we could probably do this. Yeah, let, 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 let's let's pick up let's pick up where we've where we left off. You know, this is this is not a cut and dried kind of deal, right? No, is these conversations are human conversations between two people who are very different backgrounds and very different levels of experience. I can only hope to have had the experiences you've had in your life. I've had my experiences. We both come together to have really a heart-based conversation around what actually is happening so that maybe some other people can listen to this heart-based conversation and start thinking about their lives, start thinking about what they value, because it really is all about values. So if you want to, I have a very good friend who's a great businessman in um, Kansas City, he says, in South Africa, he says, Bob, I've made a very great discovery. I said, what? And he said, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it is getting. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Keep doing the same thing over and over again. You're bound to get the same results. Exactly. So here's the thing. If in our human system, I mean, nature, nature rubs along. Says, what's going to happen to the planet? Nothing's going to happen to the planet. Something's going to happen to us. Right. I mean, things will happen to the planet, which then will, will you near, near, you know, powerful, you know, results on us. And then if we disappear, the planet will toodle along and heal itself and keep on going. So we don't need, you know, nature doesn't need us. We need nature. We need that. We, you know, yeah, right? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I've, I've been thinking about writing a book um, about my experiences and some of the things that we just talked about and, and how to get from point A to point B. And I said, the only thing that is for real um, at this particular point is I've chosen the title. Um, and I keep being told, don't, hey, look, you know, the publisher chooses the title. Oh, no, no. Yeah, but the, the purpose of the book in the title is um, it saved the planet. What a joke. It was here 4.8 billion years before we got here. It'll be here long after we're gone. There we go. There we go. So, so, so this is a great, this is a great setup for, okay, <clears throat> here's not a comprehensive list of the problems, but a pretty serious list of the issues that we're dealing with. I think we have a proactive responsibility, even though it hurts sometimes. It's much easier just to go and work out at the gym or you know, do, do what we do, figuring that someone else will figure it out. I think the reason I do these conversations is so that I can remind myself, my guests, and everyone who is listening that really these are our issues. These are our issues. And it's incumbent on us to really grasp hold and say, okay, if these are our issues, what do we do about it? How can we come together? So, Len Herring, thank you very much. This was- You're very welcome, Bob. This was a fabulous discussion. Folks, we will uh, pick up either next week or the week after, I'll let everyone know, and we'll go, uh, go for round two.